Hello there, Chris Starczewski. How are you tonight? Sunday evening. You know how excited we get when we have an opportunity to come together and recognize just great people in the field of education. And tonight, we are not going to disappoint as we have found one of the, the greatest pioneers in teacher engagement and creativity that there is out there today. This is true, Dean. How are you tonight after a short weekend, but a great weekend? I'm pretty fired up. Not only is it a Patriot Sunday, but like you just mentioned, we've got an amazing guest coming your way. Uh, has transformed the lives of many at-risk students, resistant learners, and more importantly, has brought educators to the edge of their capabilities and has pushed them beyond and into greater things based on his ideas of how to be an amazing educator and capture the interest of all. We hope our viewers tonight, Dean, will be able to follow along with us and uh, sub, uh, add some comments or questions uh, via whatever mode they're watching us, be it Facebook Live, Periscope, or YouTube TV. Uh, you go ahead and uh, get us uh, some information that you want us to ask Dave, and uh, we'll post it up on screen with you. Hey, Chris, I just want to add in one thing. You know, we've been in the leadership positions for quite a while now. And one of the things that excites me most about leadership is really giving teachers the tools to be creative and take risks in classes. And, you know, uh, having the luxury of seeing Mr. Burgess about five or six years ago in our district, I left there and I was super excited uh, when I got his autograph book. I took this back and I use this all the time to refer back to uh, different methodologies that I think just light the classroom on fire. And you can't go wrong when you go and look at something like this. Being a past history teacher, I get excited. I remember doing History Alive back when I first started off and just changed the yeah. way that kids learned. This is History Alive on steroids. So again, I can't wait. Let's get into this conversation because it's about Mr. Burgess and what he brings to the table. Why don't you take it away? Well, hey, as you heard, our guest is Teach Like a Pirate author Dave Burgess. He's an award-winning teacher from San Diego, highly sought-after PD speaker, and the author of Teach Like a Pirate, co-author of P is for Pirate, and the president of Dave Burgess Consulting Incorporated, which delivers really high-level, powerful, inspirational, innovative books, keynotes, and PD experiences for educators. As a teacher in San Diego, California, he was the 2001 and 2012 Golden Apple winner of the Grossmont Union High School District and for the 2007-2008 Teacher of the Year at West Hills High School. He was voted a faculty standout for 17 consecutive years in categories such as most entertaining, most energetic, and most dramatic. In 2014, he was recognized by the Academy of Education Arts and Sciences with the BAMI Award for Secondary School Teacher of the Year. Dave Burgess, how are you doing tonight, sir? Hey, great to join you. Thanks for having me on the show. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, we're pretty fired up. Uh, we, we've been following you for a while, and we have some educators in our building and in our, in our collegial past history as school leaders that have really subscribed to Teach Like a Pirate philosophy and have made transformative experiences for themselves and their kids. Thanks very much for all of that, and let's kick it over to Dean. Hey, Dave, again, I'm super excited to have you here today. Being a past history teacher, we kind of connect there. And I think it's important when you're delivering content that you not only deliver content, but you need a recipe to make that content stick. And when I start thinking about that, Dave, nobody does it better than you. As I was mesmerized sitting in a faculty uh, meeting area and just listening to you just espouse what it means to be creative, to be animated, to really bring an attitude. So, Dave, if you could just talk a little bit about what brought you to moving into teach, uh, teach like a pirate and writing it and getting getting inspired to do that? What is what, what kind of what was the, uh, the the idea behind all that? Yeah, so what I had to do is I had to come up with something in order to survive. I was working with a pretty tough population of students, and it was it was not a matter of like, hey, I think I'm going to come up with this cool system for teaching. It's a matter of I'm going to be in trouble here if I don't find out if I don't find a way to engage these kids, right? And so if I don't find something that's going to be successful with engaging these kids, well then I'm going to I'm going to end up burning out and getting out of this profession. And so it was a matter of uh, trial and error, trying different things, looking and seeing what was working, what wasn't working, and then it all came down to a period of time I've been teaching in my classroom for several years. And then my department chair came and met me for lunch one day. He walked in and said, "Hey, I just got put on the professional development committee for the district." thought to myself, how cool would it be if you put together a workshop based on some of that crazy stuff you're doing down in your room that nobody understands, right? <laughs> and when he said it, uh, he, he said something next to change my life. He said, but I, I don't think you can. 
because I think that your success is kind of you. I think it's personality driven. I'm not sure it's something you teach other people. And so he kind of moved on. Well, I got upset by that. I took it as a challenge. I was like, hey, sign me up for one of those workshops. I'll do one of those workshops. And so I signed up to do a full day workshop for the peers of my district. And I drove away from that meeting, uh, Chris and you going like, oh my God, what have I just done? I don't have a workshop. I don't have any of this written down. I don't have this organized in any fashion. And so I got relentless about writing down everything I do in my classroom that I thought was successful. But that wasn't good enough because that's what I do. I had to take a step back further and try to come up with where those ideas came from to begin with. And that forced me to become much more intentional about my teaching. That's why I always tell people, hey, sign up to do professional development. Sign up to present at your school site. Sign up to do a presentation for your district, for the local conference, the state conference, national conference, whatever it is. And then when you're put in a situation where you have to kind of quantify what you do, what makes you successful in your classroom and teach it to someone else, it's going to make you so much better as an educator because it's going to, it's going to have that, that moment of self-reflection and that intentionality to what you do and say, hey, yeah, how come this works and this one doesn't? That's true. Like, how come when I do this, you know, why, why is that? How can I repeat that in another with another uh, form of content? You know, and so that was a big moment in my life is coming is presenting my ideas to other teachers. Dave, what did you learn about yourself when you started that journey? Because you know what? You took a risk yourself to be able to put yourself out there. That's not easy for educators. Educators are creatures of habit. They know what they know and they're good at what they know, but expanding upon that. So, I mean, my, just going back to this full circle, what did you learn about yourself? Was it good to take that risk? Um, you know, get out of it, get out of it, get out of my way. I'm going. And you yeah, did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so this is a situation that I talk to people about all the time. It's, that, that it's, a, it's a key point. I did not have a workshop. I did not have a seminar. I did not have a notebook of ideas. I didn't have anything written down, right? But I said, yes, I'm going to do it. Like I, I, I grasped the opportunity when it was presented to me. And then now with a date on the calendar where I was going to have to stand up in front of my peers and talk to them, not for an hour. I didn't sign up for an hour workshop, eight to three. My first piece of like workshop was an all day workshop, right? And so I went from zero to an all day workshop at one time. And now I had to go and so I had to leap. And that's what I tell people all the time. It's like, listen, if you wait for if you wait to be ready before you take that leap, you're never gonna take that leap. You're never, you're never gonna feel ready. You gotta take that risk, gotta get out on that edge a little bit and jump, right? Um, and so I, and, and then I learned that, you know what? Here's one of the things that separates me. It's the questions I'm asking. Uh, hit me. Creativity is questions. The, the questions you make will determine the kind of lessons that you build. And so I think there's a type of question that I'm asking about my lessons that other educators aren't asking about their lessons. And so that's where it really hit me like, oh, I think I have something here. What are the questions that I'm asking that can now be that, that other teachers can take and ask about their content and their curriculum that will lead them to develop these, these kind of engaging ideas? And so that's, that was like one of the big realizations that I had. Questions are the key to creativity. So Dave, you know, creativity and student engagement, as you mentioned, you know, you were teaching a pretty difficult population of kids when you had this, you know, not necessarily revelation, but you had a kind of a, a, a shift in focus from kids to the challenge of presenting PD uh, to colleagues. What would be your recommendation or advice to the teacher who's um, not necessarily struggling with creativity, but how to make connections to kids to increase their level of engagement and get creative in their instructional planning. What's the entry? Yeah, so I think that there's, uh, people get overwhelmed with all of the possibilities that are in front of them rather than realize, that, hey, let me just try one thing. And then when I try one thing, let's see if it's successful or not. I'm going to try something else the next day and the next day. And so maybe they'll see me do a full-day workshop and they feel walk away going like, oh my gosh, like how am I ever going to come up with all this stuff? but they don't understand, you have to trace back. I didn't have all that stuff either. I didn't have anything, right? And then I added one thing, the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. And eventually I had this whole repertoire, I had this whole toolbox that I could go back to, right? And with Teach Like a Pirate, what I'm doing is I'm saying like, hey, here is the structure, here are the, here are the tools for you. Now you have to go and you have to use these tools. You have to experiment with these tools. You have to be willing to take a risk in your classroom. You have to be willing to step out and as Tara, Tara Martin would say, cannonball in and try some new things. And I always tell you, listen, we talk to kids about having a growth mindset all the time. A kid comes, to us, comes up to us and says, I'm not good at math. We say, whoa, 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 hold on. You're not good at math yet, right? Yeah. Or if a kid came up to us and said, listen, um, I don't feel comfortable speaking in front of the class, so I don't want to do anything where I have to speak in front of the class. As an educator, would we ever say to that kid, 
oh yeah, I totally understand that. That's kind of a thing. Just go sit quietly in the corner all year. Of course not. We will work with them and we will develop their confidence and it would start to move them and their skills clo closer and closer with closer approximations to what we want them to eventually be able to accomplish in order to where they felt where they could, they could do that, right? Well, as teachers, we have to have that same growth mindset directed towards ourselves as well. All progress is found outside of your comfort zone. So if you are never uncomfortable as a teacher, then you're not growing. And as we look at what's going on in the world right now, I think everyone is uncomfortable. And so, but what that also means is that everyone is going to have a lot of growth out of this school year, I believe. So as you, as we think about growth and that, and that idea of growth mindset and, and the ways that we can really utilize that to our advantage as educators, think about those at risk kids, the kids who don't learn in that traditional mode, that traditional style, how is it we can tap into their uh, creativity or their interests in the classroom uh, to, to really bring out that transformative experience. And, and, you know, Dean mentioned the curriculum history alive. How do we bring content alive for all types of learners? Well, in Teach Like a Pirate, there's a key tenet. It says, don't just teach a lesson, create an experience. Lessons are easily forgotten, but experiences live forever. So always look at your content and say, here's my content, not good enough. How do I make it come alive? How do I make it memorable? How do I create an experience around this? right? So it's always looking for ways that we can create an experience. Now, I look at teaching as a triple Venn diagram. There are three interlocking circles. One of those circles is content. We have to have that circle or we're just entertainers or babysitters, right? So, but there's lots of ways to learn your content. Then we have another circle that interacts with that, techniques and methods. We have, all have a toolbox of techniques and methods we've garnered from our credential programs and professional development and our colleagues and books on all that kind of stuff. But then there's a third circle that I think no one's talking about. And I've got this deal to go and talk about that third circle is what I label as presentation. So yeah, you got your content. Yeah, you got these techniques, but how are you gonna present it in such a way that it's engaging for kids? How are you gonna present it in such a way it's relevant for them? How are you gonna present it in such a way that it draws them almost magically or magnetically into what you're doing in the classroom? That's the third circle of Teach Like a Pirate. So it's putting all that on the table and saying like, yeah, this is, these are the things I want them to teach, but now let's open up all these presentational possibilities for how we can do that. Let's tap into what they're interested. You mentioned kids that, that, that learn in other ways. Hey, a top secret category of hook that I talk about in the book is rather than being so interested in trying to get kids engaged with what we're talking about, we could spend more time taking what we're talking about and tying it to what they're already engaged in. So how can we make those connections to things that they're already engaged in in their world that are already relevant for them in their world and try to tie our content to that? That's like one of the top secret categories of engagement. Thank you very much. Dave, uh, enthusiasm is a driving force of connectivity, and there's no doubt you you have that, and that's that's built in you. Not everybody has that, which is very difficult sometimes to bring out of in people. Um, and again, over time, I think they can find that. If you're going to be an educator, I think it's a vital piece of being successful. What do you mean when you talk about the commitment of being on? You know, just that commitment of just being on every single day. And how can we and how can we stay excited about lighting your fire? What does that look like in your eyes? How do you make that recipe be prevalent for every educator that you come in, come in contact with? Yeah, so here's the thing. There's lots of things, and I mentioned, I talked about this in, in the book, there's lots of things that I'm not good at, okay? And there's lots of things in education and teaching that I struggle with. Wasn't, wasn't very good at them. I was very much a learner, okay? And a beginner in some areas, right? If there was something I was good at, it was that commitment to be on. When I step in front of a group of kids, when I step in front, when I step up to do a professional development workshop and you see me walk out on stage, I'm gonna be on, right? I'm gonna be, like, I, I stand over on the side and think to myself, you know what? Like, I, I'm about to light this place on fire and burn it down around these people, okay? They have no idea what's about to happen to them, right? They're sitting out there in their seats and I'm a, they, they don't realize that there's about to be like a nuclear explosion on stage because I'm gonna, I'm gonna burn this place down, right? And so, and that's how I feel with my students too. And that I might be, maybe it's the fifth time that day that I'm giving that lesson, right? And so it might be easy to wanna kind of slide a little bit, take it easy and not give what the first period got. But I'm thinking, no, you know what? You see that kid sitting right there in the third row? It's the only time He's ever going to see this lesson. It's the only time he's ever going to skip see me present this content. It's the only time for that kid. And so I'm not selling that kid short. I'm going to do every time I step out, I'm going to do my best thing. Now there's a story. I don't know if this is true or not, but there's a story about Michael Jordan where they were talking about, Hey, here's one of the most competitive people in the world. 
who in some little game in some little city that doesn't matter because the playoffs are already clinched. They already have the top seed to play. And he's out there selling, selling out and giving his best and in full speed competitive mode. And like, how do you get up for these games? And now this, again, I don't know if this is true. This is what I've heard that he told him. He said, listen, I'm saying, I, I walk out there and I'm looking around. And I'm thinking like, you know what? Someone here is seeing Michael Jordan play for the first time. You know, and so like someone, someone saved all their money that they had so they could take their kid to come see Michael Jordan play. And this is the only time they're ever going to see Michael Jordan pro- play probably. And I, they're going to, I'm going to be Michael Jordan every night. And so that's the way I feel about teaching. Listen, I'm, when I step on, when I step up, I'm going to be Dave Burgess to the best of my ability and I'm not selling anybody short. And so I think that's a commitment that we can all make. And of course, not everyone should be Dave Burgess because they're not. It's what's, what's unique about you, your particular strengths, your talents that you are bringing to the table, but you need to bring all of those when you step up in, uh, in front of kids. Man, Dave, you know, when we talk about middle-level learners and, and middle-level education, we we always focus on the whole child, and we, we focus on building relationships first, because relationships is primary. And as, as we dive into an engaging lesson, we can have all those bells and whistles, we can have all the excitement that we want. Uh, you know, in, in, in Teach Like a Pirate, you talk about the idea of around the edges, and, and that's really where relationship is built. Can you talk a little bit about taking that relationship to the next level by, by focusing us in on what the meaning behind around the edges is? Yeah, so this, this is a, a key point that I talk about, and that is that, um, to me, uh, one minute spent informally with a student is worth 10 hours of formal instruction class time. So one minute in an informal interaction with a kid is worth basically 10 hours of formal instruction as far as building a rapport and relationships with that kid. So in other words, it's not what you do necessarily when you're like maybe delivering a lecture. It's that conversation you have when the kid shows up early, the one walks in the door, right? It's that conversation in the hallway. It's that little nod and like little, you know, uh, uh, checking in of the kid as you pass them by as you're way, on your way to the office and they're headed to lunch. It's the conversation at the snack stand or the football game or in the bleachers or the basketball game. Uh, hopefully we can get back to these things eventually where we have more, connect, more of these personal connections, right? And that's why, for example, it's uh, coaches and people who do things like, say, band and drama and stuff like that have such strong connections and relationships with their kids or maybe they'll come back and visit for years and years afterwards and they feel like this person changed my life. It's because they have all that time around the edges. You know, a coach has, uh, you know, you're stretching out out in the, um, the, the, the lobby of some, some, some gym before some game waiting for the floor to clear and your team to come out on the floor. You're on a bus trip to a road, you know, you're on a road trip or stopping at a meal for an you know, overnight tournament somewhere or something like that. You have all that time around the edges to build rapport and relationships with kids and connections. And as classroom teachers, we don't have a lot of that time. So we have to take advantage of as much of that time as we possibly can to, to, to have those informal conversations, those ways to connect with kids. You know, to Kristen Daly's point, she just posted up, and she's a huge Teach Like a Pirate fan, by the way, from Tantasco Regional Junior High School. Uh, she leads the Science T-Lap chat frequently, and um, she's been transformed by you. You know, her point about uh, the personal connection feels really hard this year uh, when we're remote. What We've had a few guests on have talked about this. I'm just curious about, you know, how you feel we can really build those connections in this virtual remote environment. Yeah, so I think it starts with understanding that the this year in particular, what's most important, maybe it's not the next content standard. Maybe it's not what's uh, uh, catching catching kids up like, oh my gosh, look how much they slipped from last year. We have to catch, spend all this time catching them up, all this kind of stuff like that. Maybe what's the most important is checking in with kids and creating those strong, uh, mm-hmm. that, that psychologically safe place for them to be. And the understanding on our part as educators that although students always come to us with some level of trauma in their life, right? This year, there's a whole layer of trauma on top of what was already there that is on, on, just on top of society, right? And that kids are coming to us with this layer of trauma on top of their life and this last, la- lack of connection and a little bit of social isolation and all of that. So maybe it's now, if, if more than ever before, it's always important, but more than ever before, let's make sure we're connecting with kids, we're checking in on kids, let's do you know, kind of some mood checks and to make sure the kids are ready and in the right space mentally in order to be able to, to uh, accept and, and interact with our content, right? And that's, what, that's what's most important. We can do that as a group, 
right? But we can also do that individually. We can create things like office hours, like places, times where students could come in that, that, that need to chat and check with, check in with you separately. And um, so, I mean, th those are a couple of possibilities. I really think this is an opportunity too to embrace what students are passionate about. So when everyone's in front of us in the classroom together, sometimes it's, it's, it's more difficult to differentiate our lessons. But now with students in separate places in many cases, there's uh, no reason why we can't differentiate more and say like, hey, here's what I want you to know, but I'm not gonna tell you how you have to demonstrate your knowledge. How do you wanna demonstrate your knowledge? Or what of this topic interest is of a, a speci especially interest to you? And maybe you wanna explore more. Maybe you wanna do a project on something that's more specific about this topic. Maybe you want to, to create something that's, uh, you know, maybe you wanna do an art project around this. Maybe you wanna create a song. Maybe I wanna do this. Not every assignment has to look the same. And by the way, as an educator, I didn't want every assignment to look the same anyway because that was boring to me, right? And so let's offer more voice and choice to our students. And that's going to be more interesting for us as well. You know, Dave, it's, it's interesting you talk about that. Chris and I speak all the time about this is a time for refining and reimagining schools because, you know, we're working a lot of times out of an antiquated formula. And it's not to, not to say that we're not doing our job educating, but the way we educate needs to change. And that change has to start from the top down to allow for that to take place in classrooms, to know that's risk free. And, and again, we, Chris and I, preach this all the time in our buildings. If it connects, with kids and it creates engagement, then run with it. You can redefine at this point in time and become innovative and creative. And it's so important. Um, mediocrity doesn't motivate, Dave. You know that. And you've said that over and over again. Um, how do we get more educators to look at themselves and to begin to embrace becoming more like an ambassador to teach like a pirate? How do we do that? Like, what do we do as leaders? What, what advice would you give us as leaders to be able to make that happen more in classrooms? Yeah, so for leaders, I would say a couple of things. First of all, not uh, if you wait for everyone on your on your campus to be ready to move some to make a move to make a shift, you're never going to make that shift. Okay, and so uh, you can't wait for everybody. So what you have to I look at this as I use a snowball analogy with leaders. So literally, you want to change the culture of your system. Here's what you do: if you wanted to build a giant snowball and you went out into the snow and you tried to grab it all up at one time, what would happen? it would all slip away from you and you'll wind up with nothing. That's not the way you build a snowball. The way you build a snowball is you get a little bit in your hands, you shape it and you pack it tight, right? And you work and you mold that and then you, and then you add a little bit more and shape and mold that, add that, eventually it gets big enough where you can put it on the ground and you can start to roll it. And the snow starts to stick eventually and eventually you build a giant snowball. That's the only way you build a giant snowball, right? Well, that's the only way you change the, uh, the culture of your system too. Change isn't something that you can announce from the podium, right? You can't just stand up at the podium one day and say, hey, this year we're gonna all teach like pirates. Here's your eye patch. And then expect that there's gonna be any sort of significant change, right? That's not gonna work, right? You say, who wants to be a part of this? You find the group of people that do wanna be a part of something different, do wanna be a part of something innovative, do wanna make a shift to what they're doing. And you work with them and you focus your energy on that group rather than allowing it being dissipated by the apathy and negativity, which may exist somewhere in your system, right? You focus, you focus on the people that do wanna be a part of the, this change. And then the energy and enthusiasm that radiates out from that group starts to attract other people in. And then you welcome them into the fold. You sort of welcome the fold. Eventually it gets big enough where you can roll it out across your whole system. But it always starts with that small little group. Like when I, people will sometimes contact me and say, I'll say, hey, I'll, I'll come in and do, I'll do a question and answer with your book club. Like, let's go. And they'll say, oh, this, they're kind of embarrassed. Cause they're like, uh, I, I don't think it's probably worth your time. There's only like five of us. And we just like meet in the staff lounge at lunch. And I'm like, are you kidding me? That's how it always starts. Like get put five teachers in a in a in a staff lunchroom together with my book. I'm coming in there every time to talk to them because I know that they're gonna get fired up, pumped up, and the teacher that teaches next to them is gonna say, Hey, how come kids are so excited about leaving your class lately? Like, what are you doing different? And that teacher's gonna say, Hey, you gotta check this out. Look at look at this book that we're reading, right? And then it starts to build, it starts to grow. It always happens with that little small group. So don't discount the possibility of what you can do in your school system because everyone at this moment doesn't buy in. They're not gonna ever all buy in at the start of it, right? That's what you are as a lead, that's why you're a leader is because you're developing something and building something from that grassroots level. The other thing I would say to leaders is listen, things like words like innovation, risk taker and all that, these are, these are fantastic buzzwords and everybody's using them, right? But listen, we don't really know 
how you feel about things like risk taking and innovation until we find out how you react when somebody fails. It's easy to talk about risk taking when you have some superstar on your campus that's going crazy and just doing amazing things. What about that teacher that tried something new and fell flat on their face and it blew up on them, right? How do you react now? If you come in in an evaluative and judgmental way, you will see re you will see less innovation and risk taking in your system. If you come in in a way that is a, as a support and as a person who's there to celebrate the courage it took for them to try something new, you will see more innovation and risk taking in your system. And so that's why I was like, you know, don't, don't just talk about risk taking and innovation. If you talk about it, then be prepared for, for it to be a support and a celeb and a, a person that celebrates courage and risk taking when the failures happen too. I love that idea of talking about celebrating uh, people taking risks. And we, you know, you, you think about social media and as, social media has two sides to it. You got a negative side, you got a positive side. I look at it as like, for example, Twitter it is an opportunity to have a PLN all the time. You can learn from people out there and you can do it from your phone. You can do it anywhere you want. But but to showcase that and to tell your story and not be afraid to show the public and the community that you're working, that great things are happening inside your classrooms. That's how you get out in front of this. And that's how you create momentum. And I think that is super exciting. So, and that's a tool we can all have at our fingertips. It totally is, you know, and, uh, you know, over the past couple of years here in Dudley Charlton, we've had those risk takers, you know, coming abroad. We had a we had a massive district wide push uh, to implement project based learning across the board. Uh, not every day, but uh, ways to get PBLs into every classroom at various points of the school year, and that required teachers to really break the mold of traditional comforts. Uh, you know, because you know when we're talking about flipping learning, it's a scary place uh, because how I don't have control you know um but you know when when teachers do have ideas like they want to teach writing in the seventh grade by creating a school-wide newspaper uh we had two educators here at dudley middle do that and uh, they created the titan times where the dms titans and they created peer editing groups and they taught the kids how to do all of the the writing skills and the editing process and uh, peer editing and then layout process and pro, uh, procedures uh through different publishing tools huge idea, but they're not sitting there writing traditional essays about the book that they read that week. Wonderful. And, you know, along the way, yeah, they failed. Uh, absolutely. But the best part about those teachers was they stuck with it. They rethought, they reimagined, they came back at it from a different angle. Uh, so I really appreciate the words, Dave, um, in terms of, you know, how to, how to get there and how to really bring and evoke, you know, true creativity and, and, and a belief system in yourself that's different. Um, Dave, you, you're, you're dynamic as heck. Um, wow. Uh, you bring the energy, you bring the enthusiasm. I would have loved to have been a history student uh, in your class. What's next for Dave? Um, you know, history teacher, author, keynote speaker, visionary pioneer for better teaching. Where do you go now? What's the next level that you're <laughs> going to jump to? You know, so right now, um, I've talked a lot about this recently. I'm a big believer in following your energy. What do you, what do you want to do when all the stuff that you have to do is done? and then trying to arrange your life so that you're, you're doing more of that. <laughs> and so for me, you know, it started with coaching. I couldn't get enough of coaching. That was my gateway drug into education was as a coach. Then I started, then when I started teaching, it was all about the teaching. I ended up leaving the coaching behind and just really focused in on the teaching hardcore. And then it became about the, the presenting and my book and trying to spread my message. And then now that's all transitioned. And what we're really trying to do is amplify the voices of other educators who we think are doing powerful work. And so, you know, with uh, what we're doing with Dave Burgess Consulting and publishing, you know, we have over 100 books that we publish now. And uh, so my focus now is trying to uh, amplify and help other educators spread their voices. I, I never feel, I always tell people, I never felt like I knew all the answers or that I was, that I had the whole story. People come up to me all the time and say, hey, how come this isn't in your book? Or how come, you, surely you're going to address this when you do book two or whatever like that. And I'm like, Hey, I wasn't trying to write the encyclopedia of teaching. <laughs> that's not that's not what Tisa Kapaya is about, right? This was my story. This was my manifesto. These were things that I that were successful for me. But there's lots of other people doing cool stuff too. And so now I've had a chance to tell my story. Now let's try to help some other people tell their stories as well. And so that's kind of what our current focus is right now. 
Hey, Dave, I got something I just want to throw in there, and I think it's important because in the back of my mind before we came on tonight, I said, if we were going to bring on a couple of people to really listen and engage in this platform with us, who would we bring in? And I first went to thinking about a couple of new teachers who were just hired. And I say to myself, what would Dave Burgess say to somebody just coming out of college, just starting right now? What would you say to that person? Yeah, so part, part of it is what I mentioned earlier, and that is that uh, what is unique about you, your particular strengths and talents, your voice that you add to your classroom is what will make you most powerful and successful with your students. It also helps you build rapport and relations with them. They start to see you as a human being as opposed to like a test preparing automaton, right? <laughs> and so adding that personality, that personal touch is, is super important. And then I would also say to them that you're going to have things blow up in your face. You're going to have problems. You're going to have uh, behavior management issues. You're going to have uh, disengagement. You're going to have apathy, all of these things. But new teachers think it's because they're new and they think it's just some issue that they're having personally that they're not very good, right? And I always say, no, 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 no. You're not having these problems in your classroom because you're new. You're having these problems in your classroom because you're a teacher and teaching is hard and it's messy. And by the way, I'm still, I said to the last day in my classroom, I was still having some of these issues. If, like if you think that you were going to walk in my class and never see a behavior management issue, that's not the truth at all, right? Or that there, I would have, like, a, so if you set up your system for success, that you're going to have, that in order for you to feel successful as an educator, if this is your rubric, that you have to have 100% engagement from 100% of your kids on 100% of your days, then you have now set up a rubric where you have guaranteed yourself a lifetime of disappointment because that's not the way that it works. These ideas will help you get better, but they're never, you're never going to reach some nirvana level of perfection. In the book, I call it life isn't 100% or fail. It's not that you either win the Super Bowl or your season was a failure, right? Or that you win the, you, know, you are the NCAA champions or else everything was a disaster. That's not the way that life is judged, okay? And so it's about that process of getting better and better. And it's about that journey to where you're trying to go and reaching your potential along the way. As a coach, they say like, here's this, here's this guy whose team was 28 and two. Here's this, this other coach who was two and 28, who had the better season. Well, I don't know just based on that, right? Because maybe that 28 and two coach should have been 30 and 0 with all the talent they had. And they're like, like, how the heck did you have that talent and lose two games? What a disaster. And I might look at that team that was two and 28 and say, I can't even imagine that this team won two games. You have to be like the greatest coach of all time. Like you guys overachieved. Like this is incredible, right? And so that's the, you, it's about reaching potential and helping kids reach their potential. And that's how we got to kind of judge ourselves. John Wooden talked about this. Where he talked about the, the success, his uh, definition of success is doing like the best, is getting the best, doing the best you can with what you have, right? And that's what success is. It's not some certain level or achievement or title or anything like that. It's reaching your potential. Man, I hope the doors open easily tonight <laughs> when I'm walking out of this office because I'd be able to run through them right now, Dave. Uh, really, um, you know, you mentioned John Wooden, personal, you know, kind of hero of mine and my top 10 to sit down and have dinner with. You know, that idea of success is having peace of mind and knowing you've given the very best of what you're capable of giving is such a powerful message. We give it to kids all the time. We give it to our staff members all the time. And, you know, we really want them to really drink that part of the Kool-Aid. Um, you know, I'm totally jazzed coming out of tonight because you've really confirmed some of the belief systems that I hold dear and near to my heart about how we can move our school forward, how we can move our learning forward. So I wanted to say thank you. Uh, for all that you've done. Uh, certainly, thank you for your time this evening. But most importantly, for me, thank you for confirming some of the real deeply held beliefs that I have and, and that I see in, in some of the most amazing teachers uh, that I've had the uh, pleasure of working with over the past you know, 26 years that I've been in this game. Hey, it was fun to join you. And but did you, do you know that I worked with John Wooden? I did not know that. That's wow. pretty awesome. So for, for three summers. I worked at the John Wooden basketball camps. They were held at Cal Lutheran College in Thousand Oaks, California. And so at a very formative time in my life, for three straight summers, I worked almost every week at the John Wooden basketball camps. So I got to interact with him and got to see him. You know, every week he'd give the pyramid of success oh, yeah. to the campers. And the parents would stay on the first day in order to sit down all together. The kids would be on the floor. The parents would be in the bleachers. And he'd do his pyramid of success and teach the campers how to put on their socks and do all that kind of <laughs> stuff like this. And I, I, I wrote a blog about that recently where I talked about putting the, put on his socks to say like, what is the first thing that John Wooden, one of the, maybe the greatest basketball coach of all time, taught his athletes, division one college athletes, 
what do you do? You learn how to put on your socks. And it wasn't necessarily that it was, um, it's not necessarily that the socks are that important, but what was important is it was like, hey, it was the mindset that everything we do here, we do with excellence. And this seems ridiculous to you right now. That I'm going to talk to you about how to put on your socks and smooth out the bottom so you don't get blisters and things like that. But we, intention, we do this with intentionality and with excellence. And that is a sign of what we're going to do in every single aspect of what we do here at UCLA, right, as, as this program. Is it's going to be done with intentionality and excellence, and it's going to start with our socks, right? And so that mindset, that idea is that when I, when I do something, it's going to be, I, thought, I talk to kids about the te- like the standardized test. Like, is this really important? Is this going to change our life? Like, what happens if we just, like, like just, you know, write down C on every answer, all the kind of stuff like this? And I don't lie to them and tell them their life's going to be changed by what their score is on their test. But I tell them, but what it is, here's, here's why I think this test is important to you. You know why it's important for you to do the best you can on your test? It's because you're doing it. And how you do anything is how you do everything. And uh, I, maybe it's not going to change your life that you got this score or this score. But we'll change, what will change your life is that when you sit down to do something, you do it with intentionality and excellence. And so, um, and that's just a way of uh, looking at the world that you're going to go out into now is that when, 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 your t- when it's your time to step up, again, that what you mentioned earlier, mediocrity doesn't motivate, right? Nobody gets up in the morning and says, like, I can't wait to go get in my day and be lukewarm, <laughs> right? Um, no, like, if you're going to do it, then 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 bring bring your excellence and your intentionality to it yep bring it on listen do you miss the coaching days i was a high school basketball coach for 12 years and i missed those times and those were so important and helped me grow as a person so much to all the things you had to go through and relationships building with kids those are good days i i I love coaching i love working with kids i love the fact that you get to see what you do then be tested in the real you talk about like real world learning and authenticity in a real world audience well, with the bleachers full on both sides and another team <laughs> trying to defeat you, you're going to be test your, your knowledge and your ability to execute the fundamentals yeah. is going to be tested under pressure, right? And we're going to win some and we're going to learn how to be good winners and we're going to lose some, learn how to be like, how to be respectful and how to like, yeah. uh, learn from that and all the, all these life lessons that coaches get to do because it's a pressure cooker situation. Um, uh, it's just, I mean, it's, coaches can change lives for sure, just as teachers can. A good coach is a great teacher. A great teacher is a great coach. Um, I was a huge believer in uh, – I'm, I'm pulling together a post on this hopefully out before too long, but on motion offense. I was a big believer in motion offense. And if you think about it, that's kind of like uh, the project-based learning of the, uh, of the uh, sports world. And that, like, I, I'm not so interested in teaching basketball plays. I'm, teaching, I'm interested in teaching kids how to play basketball, right? So I don't thinking. want to come down the floor and run like play, play 17 and have them run some pattern. You know, that's like doing a worksheet packet, right? I don't want them doing worksheet packets. I want them to come down and interact with the defense and make adjustments and, you know, set that screen at the proper angle and then read the defense and then cut off that screen based on what the defense does. And so, like, I, I would tell them, listen, I don't care if the other team comes in and scouts every single one of our practices. They can have a video camera of us practicing right now. I don't care. Because we're not going to go out there and run plays. We're going to go out there and react in a real way, in an authentic way to what they do. And we're going to learn how to space the floor, adjust and read and uh, read screens and all that kind of stuff and run a full five-person motion offense. And it can't be scouted. And plays may work in the first part of the season. But when you get to the playoffs, plays don't work, right? Because the, you're already they, they've already seen you play, right? And so I want something that's going to work in the playoffs. I want something that's going to work at the end of the season when we get to that game for the league championship or whatever it might be. And that and that's what we want kids to do too. We want them to do authentic things. We don't want them to do these artificial tasks that we prepare for them in school and, and, and expect that that's going to have some transfer over into the real life. No, let's get them to do authentic tasks and solve real world problems. And that, that's where you know, that project-based learning approach kind of uh, overlaps with kind of how I feel about how you teach things like motion offense and basketball. Well, you're creating thinkers is what you're doing. You're creating kids that can move on the fly and read and react and do the right thing. So you take that and you put that in the classroom, you just transformed education. And, yeah, uh, and, and you mentioned earlier that's scary for teachers to do project-based learning because they have to release control. Yeah. That, that's scary. For, and that's, a, that's the same feeling as a coach too. Sure. It's because you know that, uh, it's very easy to try to run a very regimented and scripted offense, right? Where you're going to try to, you move here to there, to this, to this, this. And as a coach that gives you great control, 
But when you release that control and you say, no, 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 every, every trip down the floor, it's going to look a little different because every trip down the floor, they're going to adjust to different things that are happening to them in the, in the flow of the game. Um, then th that's a little scary, but it's, but it's also teaching them skills with a little bit of transfer to any basketball game, any gym that they go play in, anything like that. Like I was the big believer, you know, if, the, if we got the ball, we're, we're, we're down one and we get the rebound with 10 seconds left. Some coaches immediately are like, time out. I want to design my last play. I'm like, you get the rebound, 10 seconds left. Let's go. While the defense is still loosey goosey and not set for us. And let's just go on the fly right now. And let's, and I, I trust my kids and my players that they're going to be able to re react and make good decisions because it's something that we worked on all year rather than like me setting up a side out of bounds play to get like a final shot. Um, uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to set up a side out of bounds play and then all of a sudden have them come out in some uh, different defense. that's going to mess us all up and I have to call a second timeout that maybe I don't have or something like that. Get the ball, outlet it to the point guard. Let's go. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. That's uh, right up my alley. So, hey, listen, uh, Dave, we really appreciate you tonight. We appreciate your wisdom, uh, your thought process, all the things you've done for educators uh, around the world, not just in the country. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to dig in and get into the weeds a little bit and really look at what Teach Like a Pirate is all about. Uh, it's an ongoing, I would call, Bible for educators as they just try to be great. And there's no other way to look at it. And, uh, you know, your time here tonight is valuable. We recognize that. And we really want to say thank you. So, Chris, I'm going to hand it off to you. Why don't you just wrap it up for us? We'll go from there. You got it, Dean. You know, Dave, you know, Dean nailed it right there with the with the shout out and the thank you for, you know, really confirming permission uh, to think differently about teaching and learning and and come at it from whatever angle you feel as a classroom teacher is best. You know, there shouldn't be a principal who's out there saying the scripted lesson with the four minute activator and the 10 minute warm up activity and the 12 minute teacher talk is what we do here. What we do here is what you feel is best to reach your kids. Focus on the person, focus on the content, focus on the experience. And I love the idea of selling tickets to your lesson. Would you yeah. buy a ticket to your own show? Empowering hey, others too. Don't forget about empowering others. Give them that feeling of that they can do it without, without reservation. That's the key. Without a doubt, you know, um, everybody out there and unlock the middle land. We are middle level educators working our hardest to have fun and allow our teachers to have the best PLN possible. And that's how unlock the middle was formed. This is not about us. This is about building a library of resources to help extend and make connections. We hope you enjoyed our time here tonight with author and captain of the ship, Dave Burgess. Teach like a pirate fame. Uh, we certainly had a blast. We hope you learned a thing or two. And remember, everybody, work hard to be better, be safe, be well, and be happy.